Well, I think of Cain as, well... You do believe Cain existed? I think the pattern that Cain represents is an eternal pattern. And so ah, yes, it's a higher different. level of existence. That's different. I, I, I realize well, that. there are Cain types who exist. And they're yeah, very yeah, well yeah. Made. There are Cain types. Yeah, but, yeah. But Cain himself, I mean, you, you give the game away where you say in your book, Cain and Abel were the first humans to be born in the natural way. Now that, mm -hmm. that betrays you as, as, as it were, pretending you think they really existed because you wouldn't have said they were born in a natural way unless you were muddling up facts with symbols there because you don't think that, that Cain and Abel existed. Well, I don't. What do I think about Cain and Abel? I, I said, I think the pattern that they represent always exists. Always exists. You understand, you understand that that's a different thing. What's a different now, matter? A pattern that they represent, the, the conflict between brothers, the rivalry yeah. between, between brothers, this is a fundamental pattern, which, which yes, it's something that, that's there. But I care about facts. I mean, did they exist or did they not exist? Well, I can imagine a situation where when the story was originated, that it referred to two actual brothers. But as the stories propagate, across time as they mutate, as they adapt, let's say, to the to the structure of human memory, they deepen and they become broader. And so then they become emblematic, not only of the pattern of conflict that might characterize the original two brothers that the story was about, but about the conflict between brothers as such, and then the more fundamental levels of conflict that exist within human beings, which is what you see in more sophisticated literature. It's like the biblical accounts speak of fact in a factual manner upon occasion, but the biblical accounts also speak poetically and metaphorically and allegorically, and people who are sophisticated in biblical analysis have known this for centuries. The bibl biblical literists generally suffer from the problem that they don't even know what it means to be literalist. There's lots of unsophisticated ways of approaching a text. Okay, let's see what so, Professor Dawkins thinks about that. Well, I, I, I suppose I'm a literalist. I mean, and and you give the game away when you, when you say Cain and Abel were the first humans to be born in a natural way. Well, I'm speaking allegorically there within the confines of the text. I mean, what I meant by that was that the way the story lays itself out is that Adam and Eve are created by God. They don't, they're not emblematic of the pattern of human beings that exist in fallen history. Within the confines of the text, the first two people who are genuine, who aren't creations of the divine, are Cain and Abel. And so for me, they're emblematic of the patterns of conflict that rip people apart in the world of history, in yes. the world of normal history. Professor Dawkins, I know you take particular umbrage with that statement that Cain and Abel were the first normally born uh, human beings, but I think if I understand Dr. Peterson correctly, there are things that can be sort of true within a story. It's true that Sherlock Holmes lives at 221B Baker Street. And as far as I understand, that's maybe what you mean by uh, the, the truth in the matter of, of Cain and Abel being the first naturally born yeah, humans. In it's the, internal to well, the story. Well, in the context of this story, they're the first two spirits or patterns, you could think of, patterns of perception and action yes. that, that characterize human existence in the fallen world, right? So they're emblematic of what happens in history outside of the whatever is meant by the pre-existent paradise. At, at the same time, you must know, I know this comes up all of the time when somebody says, but did Cain and Abel really exist? And I know that you want to say that the, the story which I they... think it's a silly question. I think it's like asking whether Raskolnikov existed in Crime and Punishment. Like, it's not, it's not a trivial question, because you can answer yes and you can answer no. You can say, well, there was no such specific person as Raskolnikov, but you... It's, a, it's not a helpful question because the reason that Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment is a masterpiece is because Raskolnikov was everywhere in Russia when Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment. And so Raskolnikov is hyper-real, not not real. But to be clear, is that how you feel about Cain and Abel? That, that, that is to say, an identifiable hyper -real. homo sapiens called Cain it's who murders his in a, brother. In a sense, it's irrelevant to me because it, even if they were real... Like, we don't know anything about them as well, historical of course they weren't figures. Really, course, even if they weren't real, of course they weren't real. Well, like I said, it could have been the case that where, when the story originated, way back when it originated, that the first people that were described by the first person who generated the seeds of the Cain and Abel story were referring to actual people. But it doesn't matter because the, the, the text has been compressed and modified over a vast span of time, and it's accreted all sorts of meanings that certainly weren't part and parcel of whatever the original yeah, well, let's story take, was. Let's take the point Alex was certainly making. Um, 
within the confines of the story. Um, Dostoevsky was a great writer. What makes you think the writers of Genesis were a great writer? I mean, who were they? We don't we know nothing about them. Well, I think they well, I think they were great writers because I think I understand the patterning of the stories and what it points to. I I think the idea, for example, that Cain and Abel are emblematic of two opposed patterns of adaptation to the world is brilliant. It's 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 almost brilliant beyond imagining, especially because the story is so insanely compressed. And it's certainly evident to me as a clinician that the patterns that are portrayed in the story of Cain and Abel play themselves out in the real world continually and terribly, terribly. You think the author of, of that story in Genesis was a literary genius? I think that there's a spirit of literary genius at work across millennia crafting that story so that it has almost an infinite depth. How that relates to the original author or sequential authors, I don't know, because it's lost in the seeds of time. It's lost in the, it's lost in history. So the story I mean, they, evolved, they, you're saying it's the story... Like a meme. It, yes, yes, it well, evolved. That's interesting. If, it if, evolved if, to match the contours of the human memory. That's exactly it, is that these stories, that's part of their archetypal nature. Like, so they have a emotional and motivational expression, but as they propagate across time, they also evolve so they're maximally memorable. And they're maximally memorable for a biological reason. Well, that's very interesting. If they did, really did, did evolve over time, if you, can, if you could actually trace successive manuscripts, you can't do that. I mean, there's, there's presumably a couple of Hebrew manuscripts and a, and a Greek one. And I mean, what, do you, what do you mean when you say it evolved? Well, I, I would say you can see that in the compilation of the biblical texts, because one of the things that you see evolve, you know, and you criticized the biblical text at one point, correct me if I've got this wrong, because I don't want to get this wrong. You said that there isn't anything in the biblical text that constitutes, let's say, a uh, significant original discovery, which is something that you'd expect if it was of divine providence, let's say, divine providence. And so, and I, I think, you know, I was thinking about that objection, and I think that one of the uh, discoveries that the text lays bare in an, in an insanely brilliant manner is that the foundation of the community is sacrifice, that that's an appropriate conceptualization. And you can see the concept of sacrifice evolve across the biblical texts as they're sequenced chronologically in the, what, in the overall story that makes up the biblical, the biblical text. The idea of sacrifice becomes more and more sophisticated. It's more and more elaborated. It's more and more specified. It's more and more embodied. There's an obvious progression in well, ideas. Well, the progression, where do you see that progression? In, in successive manuscripts? Or I, I it's don't... In, in the successive stories as the, story, as the text progresses. The way, the way a novel progresses. So something like sacrifice in the Old Testament. Sacrifice in the Old Testament. No, through the entire, through all well, the way the through New Testament, the New Testament. The text is a sacrificial, is a sacrificial story as well. The passion story is a story of sacrifice. It's, it is and indeed. The, the sacrificial motif recurs continually through the biblical text, and it's elaborated constantly. And okay, so the, the criticism is, the Bible as a text gives us nothing to indicate that it has divine. Uh, origin. There's nothing that we can read in it where we think there's no way this idea could have evolved were it not uh, divinely put into this text. That's a criticism that perhaps is, is Professor that Dawkins think? made in the past. Is, is well, divine. I think it's reflective of some of some order that's so profound and implicit that there isn't a better way of describing it than divine. But I don't really care if we if we look at that from the bottom up like as a biological phenomenon or as from the top down. I don't think it makes any difference. It doesn't make a difference whether it was divinely inspired or whether it evolved within human... I don't think fundamentally... Look, if... Okay, so, so let me ask you this. Like, I think that at bottom, truth is unified. And what that's going to mean eventually is that the world of value and the world of fact coincide in some manner that we don't yet understand. And I think that that union, the fact of that union and the... the, the the fact of that union is equivalent to what's being described as divine order across millennia. There's no difference. Now, and here's, this is a tricky business because you either believe that the world of truth is unified in the final analysis or you don't. Those are the options. And if it's not unified, then it's, it's, there's a disunity. There's a contradiction between value and fact, or there's a contradiction well, there's a contradiction between different sets of values and they can't be brought into unity. I don't believe that. Well, let's go back to what you said earlier, which I was very interested in. Um, you implied there's no difference between whether the text is divinely inspired or whether it evolved in progression during a series of uh, 
manuscripts, presumably. Now, I think that's genuinely interesting, but it's a huge difference. It's not the same thing. I mean, either it was divinely inspired or it wasn't. Well, it's the same thing if it's fundamentally reflective of the, and accurately reflective of the implicit logos or order. And I think it is. Like, l l let me explain that a, a moment. Like, it took me a long time to understand the concept of sacrifice in the biblical text, because it seems so anachronistic and so primitive, you know, and primitive and uh, not understandable. What are these people doing offering, you know, choice cuts of meat to a god that lives in the sky? Something it's, disgusting it's, about it. Well, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to satirize, but when you start to understand that perception itself is sacrificial in its nature, and you start to understand that there's no difference between work and sacrifice, that they're the same thing, and you understand that community is predicated on sacrifice, then the emphasis in the text on sacrifice starts to become something quite marked and remarkable, especially because it's implicit. It isn't obvious at all that the authors of the texts and the editors who sequenced them actually understood what it was that they were highlighting. So with regards to the community, why is the community predicated on sacrifice? Because it's not about you, the community. Every step you take towards the communitarian means that you sacrifice something that's local to what you want here and now, right now. I think you have to give something up. You're, you're, you're wandering onto something else now, which is, which is something quite, quite different. Um, the notion of sacrifice, as you say, it, it goes right through the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. The sacrifice of Isaac or Ishmael by Abraham and, and the sacrifice of Jesus um, is the same idea uh, I think it's a very unpleasant idea, by the way. Um, but what are you actually saying? Are you saying that uh, Abraham did or did not sacrifice Isaac? Are you saying that Jesus really was, Jesus really did die for our sins? I mean, do you believe that? There are, there are. Do you believe that as a fact, that, that, that Jesus died for our sins? <laughs>